Welcome to another weekly Ask GMBN Tech. Um, you know the drill, if you've got any questions about mountain bikes and tech related stuff, get them in in the comments below or at the email address at the bottom of the screen right there. Um, here with Henry this time, I'm gonna rip into the questions and Henry's gonna get a crack in with the answers. All right, let's do it. Good to go, All right. So yeah. first up is from Ty Teasdale this week. Why does my Fox 36 fork have a five mil dead zone at the start of travel? When I compress it by hand, it rebounds, but then to completely extend it, you have to pull it by hand, basically. I know this thing. Yes, so it's a pretty common thing with modern forks. Basically, in your fork, it has two air chambers. There's a positive air, which basically affects, which what you read the air pressure from, and it affects how much support your fork has, how much it sits up mm. in its travel but there's also a thing called a negative air chamber. Now what a negative air chamber is there to do is actually suck the fork down for you. This is to overcome all the friction in the seals and all that sort of stuff. Now, it isn't a problem that five mil, it's absolutely It's fine. not a lot to be fair, it's is it? It's not a lot. Yeah. If, your, if your fork is stuck down, you know, 30 mil into the travel, sometimes they can, it can be basically there's too much um, pressure in the negative air and what you can do then is let the pressure out your fork, pull it apart real hard and sometimes it equalize, Sometimes not. It depends if there's a bit of um, grease. Yeah. So there's a little equaliser port between between the two. So you have, you inflate it through one valve, and sometimes manufacturers put a load mm. of grease in there for some unknown reason. Yeah. We had we had one recently a brand new fork. It's completely sucked down. Yeah. And then the internal rod had actually got stuck. Had to take the whole thing apart. Yeah. And it's a funny one. If you want to know a really good way to know what your negative air does is next time you're pumping up your forks when they go from absolutely zero psi. So you pump it up to say I don't know 80 psi, whatever and they'll be really hard to compress. They won't move at all. Mm. Once you get them into the stroke, every, you hear tss, and that's basically the negative air chamber pressurizing. And every subsequent cycle you do, it will do it, it will pressurize it until it's balanced, and then you'll notice your forks are a lot more active. But to begin with, you can pretty much lean on them. Yeah, for sure, they don't do anything. Don't do anything. And then they kind of give in a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quite totally. linear, really, to be fair. Yes, so yes, yeah. The way it works. Yeah. Yes, there you go. So it's nothing to worry about, but there's a number of little things you could do. Um, I saw actually on your question, which I didn't read out, you tried the old cable tie trick. So for those that don't know that, sometimes if you get air stuck in the lower leg, if you put the blunt end of a cable tie on the inside of the fork seal, you can just purge that air out. Um, also worthy of try if you've got a similar problem. So this is a question from Sandy Norman. It says, hi Doddy, thanks for, uh, for being you. Well, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> Someone appreciates it at least. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna go past the quite poetic tribute and straight to the meat of the question. <laughs> he bought a new two year um, cone operator and basically he, from a shop and then converted it for better climbing, it went tubeless also. Yep. The downhill tubeless rear tire went dry somehow and I lost the bead. I had a tube and an older version of the Maxxis Minion tire from when I went, for, I had a Santa Cruz build in 2000. I didn't want it to go to waste so I lost it on and went riding. Basically halfway through a ride, there was a bulging out of the bead area, and he wants to know. So is this unseated? Does it yeah, sound like? it sounds like it's unseated, yeah. Yeah, there's a number of things really with this sort of thing. It's, I think you notice it more with a tubeless tire because you rely on it being completely, the bead completely stuck into the hook on the rim. Um, so the profile of a rim, you have like a U shape and they quite often have like a hook at the top. Now the bead can run around within that and if it's not quite in place, uh, which it sounds like it may not be on your one, uh, that could be part of the problem. Now if that is a problem and you find you're struggling when you put the tire on in the first place, something you can do is warm soapy water that can help the bead basically pop into place correctly. And there's also a chance it could be delaminated, which we have seen time to time with tires where the inner and outer skins of the yeah. tire can come away. Uh, the characteristic there tends to be the whole casing sort of wobbling around a bit or like weird bulges that you sometimes get sometimes. Yeah. He also said you, you, you put a tube in there and sometimes if you don't make sure the tube is inside the carcass of the tire. Yeah, fully. A little yeah. bit. It can, can push just, it out. Just lift yeah, it up point. on the bead. Um, yeah, it sounds like it's... There's a number of things you can do there but it's yeah. again it doesn't sound like anything bad. No. Um, yeah, try the warm water trick with the soapy water. I've always found that works yeah, for me. Yeah. And you could used to get actually a product back in the day called beadwax. Oh, nice. I don't know if people still use that stuff, but Tioga used to make it. Is that where the phrase mind your own beeswax comes from? <laughs> yeah, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so wheel related this time from Aditya Shindi. Um, hi guys, I want some tips to make mountain bike wheels stiffer and stronger for free riding. What tips would you suggest? Oh, this is... custom building a rim. Right, well, okay, so without boring anyone to death or <laughs> going into it, Stiffness and strength are at different ends of the same spectrum. So think of like a, a house brick is very, very stiff and a bathroom sponge is very, very soft. If you chuck one from the roof of your house, 
the brittler, the stiffer, I think, is going to shatter yep. when the sponge will bounce. Similarly, if we've you... seen that with some rims in the yeah. past. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if you stand on it, it's going to, yeah, again, give really different results. Yeah. So a stiff rim will often actually sometimes, like a track rim, is very stiff. The power transfer is amazing, but it is more brittle. Yeah. Whereas a, you kind of would tend to want to build your downhill rims at slightly lower spoke tension, but, and there is a but, this is where a good quality of rim and spokes come into it. Mm -hmm. Something like a DT471 will be very stiff this way, yep. but also give a nice amount of spring and comfort. Yeah, compliance almost. Compliance, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, and that's actually why one of the reasons carbon rims are so amazing. It's not a weight thing, but if you ride carbon rims, like going from berm to berm, are just amazing because they do have so much so much spring, you know? Well, some do, and some, some are also, I found, are yeah, so stiff, stiff they're almost, yeah. Yeah, almost painful. Mm. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, you should have, you couldn't look for two things. Yes, you, totally. should, you shouldn't just look for a single thing out of a wheel. Yeah, but double, double butted spokes. Yeah, three cross. Yeah, pretty standard to yeah. do three cross. Yeah, I wouldn't go for any flimsy spokes. Definitely double butted. Yeah, um, Sapim or DT maybe. Yeah, stuff I don't know. Yeah. The last time I built wheels was Sapim, I think. Mm. And if you go for, for, if you're doing some hard riding, going for um, brass nipples. Yes. And also a little thing you can do is if you want to put washers on there and even grease them, it will actually help the whole nipple and spoke just turn as, as the bike goes That's to torque horses. Yeah. Yeah. So I think at one point I'd love to do a really in-depth wheel let's, building let's video. Let's do it. Yeah. yeah 100%. And just talk about yeah. little if, tips Even and for people that aren't going to build a wheel, I think just the understanding of yes, what totally. goes into it and why it makes it strong, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. we'll put that one down, definitely. This is from Judd Le Lemkul, I think. Anyway. So, hi. I can't seem to find any information about this. Hopefully Doddy has some advice. How often should I replace my hydraulic hoses? My SLX brake started leaking mineral oil from the part where the banjo connects to the hose from the metal sleeve. Hmm. Do I need to replace the hose or does the banjo come apart? Is this a perishable part like brake cables that should be replaced at a certain interval? Um, I don't think they should, certainly not in a mineral oil case because it's a non-corrosive oil so I wouldn't have thought it'd have any problems. Um, that said, mineral oil um, is I can't remember if it's hydrophobic or not, but basically if you get water into the lines, it can corrode the inside. Mm. Um, I don't think that's the issue though. I suspect with yours, it's probably the either the banjo end or the compression nut. Mm. Um, because you, although you can change them around, you can take them off, you should put a fresh one on each time that's done. So yes. there's a chance of your bike, it hasn't been done. And that's a super easy thing to do. It would mean basically taking that relevant end of the hose out literally snipping off that bit, replacing that, and putting a new barb on the inside. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do that at home with, with no tools, where there's proper tools available to do that job. It's pretty simple, yeah. but you'll need to bleed your brakes afterwards. If, if it is at the caliper end and it's yeah. where the crimp is, yeah. that can be a new cable, which isn't That's a case a of yeah. the cable the, sorry, the hose having perished, yeah. but it's the fact of the way they manufacture it. Manufacture with the banjo on there. Yeah, yeah it's anyway. a good shout, yeah. Something I've seen before is sometimes you can get at the, well either end really, but it happens more at the lever end, is it can get almost like an ulcer. You know what I mean? Where like the oil has come out and basically managed to go out the pressure down the outside of the hose lining. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. And you yeah, see yeah, a little yeah. bubble and you yeah. see it and you pull the lever, you, you pull the cover off, yeah. you pull the lever and it's like pulsating it. You, yeah, I know, <laughs> you know? I know, yeah. And yeah, it can pop all of a sudden yeah. and then you lose all brake pressure. So yeah, look out for that one. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's a perishable time that you no. need to replace that no. stuff. If there's obvious damage, if it's kinked, if it's bent, if it's got wear marks in it, then yeah, mm -hmm. it's a brake line, so you should replace it. Um, they're easy to replace though, so it's nothing to be concerned about. Yeah, and it's one of those, when you see really old bikes and you're working on them, often mm -hmm. it's the brake lines, which are the only good bits of the brake. Yeah. You know, it's yeah, the calipers yeah. done, the levers done. Yeah. Oh, the brake line, we can salvage that, you know? So I've, uh, not that you know this yet, but I've put you down to make a video on um, basically doing a full brake refresh. Oh, lovely. And I'll be cool. like, <laughs> exactly, replacing the brake line. Yeah. I think it's good in there, we should do, um, not that you ever really have to do it anymore, but like um, greasing the pistons. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you get sticky pistons in there. I think we'll do a full breakdown on yeah. how they work. Yeah. We could right. split it into a couple of videos, maybe explainer and then how you do it. Sounds good. But shouldn't be afraid of brakes, they're actually pretty simple. Okay, next up from Rob Allen. Um, I've got a 2014, I think, Marzocchi Dirt Jump Fork. Uh, bought it second hand, but the Schrader valve has snapped off on the inside of the top cap and there's a strip thread on the dropouts. A, is it worth tapping a dropout and where could I, and could I get a replacement top cap? B, basically. Um, or is it game over? Ooh, I mean, they were quite a common fork from a couple of years ago. Yeah. 
So if you have your wits about, you can probably, you know, scour eBay or whatnot and 100%, get something yeah, yeah. you can sell your parts. Top cap, I would have thought you could get one of those as a spare. Yeah. Without totally. too much hardship. And I'd, I'd look for something that, say if someone had a problem with the CSU, which is the crown steering unit, the part yeah. that goes through the, through the frame. Because if they had an issue with that and that's why they're selling it cheap, those are problems unrelated. Yeah. Unrelated to his. Yeah. So for like yeah. the lowers, then they should hopefully be all good. Yeah, um, it's worth ringing up as well, If uh, in addition to eBay, any suspension tuners that might be in your area, because quite often they do those replacement parts and they keep all the old CSUs, they keep the old lowers, anything they can to salvage for parts for other stuff like what you might need. Mm. Uh, so definitely worth a phone call or an email to your nearest place. So the next question is from Julian. I'm so bad with these names. You're not as bad as Blake, so don't oh, worry. I just feel like I'm walking a knife edge, eh? Hey, right. It's fine, people will correct us if we do get it wrong. We're sorry if we do, we're we sorry. try and get it right. They say, hey JMBN, great show. Is it okay to spray pressurized water on your rotor and brake calipers? Thank you. Yeah, it's fine. Um, there is always a chance when putting water anywhere near a bike, you could get grease from any part of your transmission or that near them. But yeah, use your common sense, it should be fine. Uh, if you're using pressurized water, we don't need to tell you, you should know to be careful around bearings, you know, your hubs, your bottom bracket, your pivots on your bike. Um, I've always used pressurized water, it's fine. Just don't do it directly to those sort of parts of the bike and you should be all right. Yeah. That said, a bucket and brush is technically the best way to do it. You should have two brushes, uh, one for those areas like your brakes. You don't want contaminated, one for doing all the mucky stuff. All right, this one's from the peculiarly named Zend Out, I guess, yeah. Um, are there any advantages to putting a longer stroke shock on my bike? Oh, this is a good one. So, with a the shock, there are two key measurements. There's the eye to eye, mm -hmm. which is where the two hard red bolts go through. Yep. And then there is your stroke length. So some shocks might have the same eye to eye, but different stroke lengths. Uh, yes. So that will mean that your linkage, your axle will go deeper into the stroke. They all have a leverage ratio, but mm -hmm. you know, like two to one or 2.1 to one, which basically means the axle does two times the amount of the travel of the, of the shock. So if you increase the travel of the stroke, which means how much the shock can actually compress, then suddenly you might run You're into problems. Altering it. Yeah. yeah, to look at the bike when it's in its standard you know, unweighted position, the geometry will be exactly the same. Mm -hmm. It will look, there'll be no, nothing to suggest that it wouldn't work. However, once you go into its travel, especially at bottom out, you might find not just buzzing the, the uh, seat tube. Yeah, of course, tight in the frame. Yeah, yeah. the seat tube. It, yeah. The bottom bracket will be going way lo long, lower. Mm. And you know, I mean, if you ever met an engineer, they probably told you they're, they're pretty, pretty sensible folk there got their head screwed on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, also, um, I think you talked about this the other day, you know, if it's got five mil more stroke at the shock, that could be significantly more at the back wheel. Mm. It's really gonna change how it feels. Yeah, and it's, it's also- It's the, not a good thing. The five stroke in the shock, mm -hmm. the key thing is it's not gonna transla translate to five mil more travel at the back. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's not gonna yeah. take your 160 bike up to 165 mil. Yeah. It's gonna take your 160 bike up to Good no God knows what, really. Uh, who knows, depends, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, another thing to factor in, um, you said about eye to eye and then stroke length. If you just went for a slightly longer eye to eye shock, then you've got the opposite problem of mm. your frame. Basically, the frame might not actually be able to accept that at all. So yeah. really, you should stick to the correct measurements for that bike. Um, and also, you probably invalidate your warranty too. Yeah. Bit of a pain that is. Yeah, I was just riding along. Yep. Yeah. That's not gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last one this week, and this is, I have heard about this, but I've not experienced it myself. So Dave Stout says he's got a new pair of XT brakes, the four piston ones. He says the brakes work fine, um, but the rear brake lever makes a slight clicking uh, sound when engaging the lever. He says you can feel it through the brakes mm. a bit. Um, curious, is this not a common issue or or any issue at all? Yeah, I mean, it is a sort of, a sort of common issue, yeah. semi-common. Yeah, I've heard of it, but I've got to say yeah. I've not felt it myself. I can kind of imagine how it might feel. I have had it on my brakes in the past, and I've got it. In fact, I've got it. I've got a set of XD4 pots mm -hmm. on my trail bike at the moment, and they do click a bit. I think what it is is there's a the little cam that drives the master cylinder. Yeah. I think it's basically it binds up and then slips. Yeah, okay, and then I, it gives yeah, almost. I think it's something like that. So in the past, yeah. I've gone in there with a paintbrush and some very fine oil, yeah. like suspension fluid, and just. Uh, and tried to get everything like sliding again smoothly, yeah. and it stopped it for maybe a ride and a half. <laughs> um, oh yeah, it's quite unlucky then if that's what it is. Yeah, yeah. I would say maybe even speak to a local bike shop. I have heard about when yeah. they get real bad, it's referred to as the death click. Yeah, and I have. I have known it to be warranted, but yeah. that's not my decision. I'm not weighing in on that at all. Yeah. Um, 
but it's not going to affect the performance of the brake and it's not going to mean you're going to lose power or anything yeah. it's just a bit of a bit of an annoyance yeah like henry said though definitely check with your local bike shop if you want to try and remedy it yourself by using a bit of oil just make sure it's oil it's not going to eat into your lever at all yeah. like a silicon lube or a suspension lube will be fine on there it's not going to damage anything mm. but don't get it near your pads obviously you'll regret yeah. that one all right, there we go. There's another weekly Ask GMBN Tech in the bag. Um, for another brake-related video, click down here if you want to learn everything about customising your brake setup. And if you want to see how Doddy and I got on at the Bespoke Bristol show, mm. click down here. As always, don't forget to share and like our content. Give us a thumbs up. Cheers, guys.